So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, A Greener World Tech for the Win. This promises to be really fun and interesting. My name is Danny Glazer. I'm one of the three program directors of the Green Business Partnership, along with Scott Fernquist and Yana Petrakova. So today's webinar is being recorded, will be available on the GBP website this week. So please keep yourself on mute. Feel free to enter any questions in the chat box at any point during the webinar, and we will do a fun Q&A at the end. And for those not familiar with our program, the Green Business Partnership was founded in 2009 as a public-private partnership between the Business Council of Westchester, Westchester County Government, and Green Team Spirit. The GBP is a mission-driven nonprofit membership organization that awards official green business certification and fosters a thriving green business community. We are grateful to all of our sponsors who support our program. You can see on this slide, um, with particular mention of Con Edison and the Westchester Community Foundation, our platinum level sponsors for many, many years. So the Green Business Partnership has more than 160 diverse organizational members and 65 have achieved green business certification. We help members to identify and address those areas of operations that have the greatest impact on the environment and set them on a path toward reduction. You can learn more about our program on our website, greenbusinesspartnership.org. Now it's my pleasure to pass this program on to Joe Pizzamenti of CCLEAN, president of CCLEAN and GBP member who suggested today's topic, Joe's and, and this program. Uh, so Joe's company specializes in green cleaning of corporate, medical and educational facilities using Green Seal certified cleaning products. So Joe, uh, my pleasure to pass it on to you. Take it away. And I'm going to so stop much, sharing Jimmy. my screen. I'm going to. Let me stop my screen share so we can all see you. Okay. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, as you know, I love learning about technology that can help me or my clients work smarter, especially when it comes to automation and things like pre predicting usage to reduce waste. It saves money and it's an essential weapon against the in the fight against climate change. We're already starting to see these strategies implemented in the buildings where we work, and I thought that the Green Business Partnership community might find it as interesting as I do. It's definitely the future of facilities management and sustainable business. So without any further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce MicroShare Executive Vice President Phil Adams, who's a longtime tech entrepreneur in the green energy space. Phil has always had a keen interest in the environment, probably set on his path on this path by his mother who always told him to leave things the way you found them. Phil has served as CEO of online energy broker, World Energy Solutions, which pioneered the introduction of green power into energy procurements, implemented the auctioning of carbon credits for the United States first cap and trade program, RGGI, and created a division to implement energy retrofits within 15 utility rebate programs. He has also served as an executive in residence for the Clean Air Task Force, advising on decarbonizing the maritime shipping sector, and is head of the South Coast chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Phil recently joined MicroShare, which applies sensing technology to enable companies to monitor and reduce energy consumption and meet ESG reporting requ requirements. Take it away, Phil. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Danny. And thank you for all the Green Business Partnership folks for inviting me here. Um, I'm not sure how to see everybody who doesn't have their camera on, but I'm just show of hands. How many people are excited to be in another Zoom call? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got some zeros up there, right? So uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm happy to be here and um, let me just get started. And um, I wanna try to make this as fun as possible for everybody. So um, I'm be a little irreverent and maybe take a little longer view. I don't wanna make this a microshare commercial, although I'll tell you a little bit our, about our products towards the end. Um, there's the myth or legend or parable of the boiling frog does everybody know that parable? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, I'm getting some no's. 
Um, so the idea is a frog is a cold blooded mammal. So if you put a frog in cold water and slowly turn up the heat, it'll just get hotter and hotter, hotter and die because its internal temperature just adjusts to the water temperature and eventually it gets just too hot to support life. However, if you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, it'll jump right out because it registers the temperature difference. Not that I recommend anybody starts throwing frogs in pots of boiling water, but I just say that to say that, you know, we can be like that frog sometimes, like things are changing in our environment. We're really not noticing. We're just kind of rolling along with it. And then all of a sudden there's a huge amount of change. And um, I do think we're in kind of an era where that's happening. Um, in the 2020s, let's just start with that. Welcome to the 2020s. What a start to the decade, huh? We've had a pandemic that swamped our hospitals. We had toilet paper shortages, homeschooling, work from home. It's been just a really, really challenging start to this decade. And uh, the chart on the right there is Zoom stock versus the uh, Standard & Poor's. So if you had bought Zoom stock at the beginning of the pandemic, good for you. But it's really kind of a very disruptive time. And we've all lived through it and are still living through it to a certain extent. It's gonna define our lives probably for our lifetime. There have been some good things that have come out of it though. Um, there's a lot more outdoor dining, which is actually kind of fun. You go down downtown Boston in the South End and there are all these restaurants and in New York and Philadelphia, wherever on the street that have taken over the parking spaces in front of their building. And it really kind of feels a little bit like Paris. So there's some good that's come out of it. You've got cocktails to go, which seems kind of like a good idea. Maybe that'll stay. And this is one of my favorites, the, the Anchor Animal Hospital. You just pull up send them a text, they take your pet away, they take care of your pet, you sit in the car, listen to music and, and you're on your way. So uh, while the pandemic has been difficult and just to be a little lighthearted, there are some things that I think will actually last and be improvements to life because of the pandemic. What else about the 2020s? Hottest year on record. That's kind of a sobering chart, right? This is a little bit like the boiling frog. You didn't really notice the temperature going up in the 70s, but as, as time goes on, it's getting worse and worse. Crazy time with ransomware, right? Like the whole pipeline shut down, the colonial pipeline because of a hack. And then not really in the news anymore, but it seemed like people hacked into the entire federal government computer systems at some point. Wonder what's coming of that. Robin Hood, the green feather over here, has turned the stock markets upside down, right? With you know promoting stocks like GameStop and, and AMC movie theaters to crazy heights and then and crashing them again. So the whole idea of the stock market really is changing. Certainly, social unrest and calls for social justice have been part of this 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 emerging decade, and the idea of Bitcoin. So all of a sudden, a currency that really didn't people know about is now getting to the fore. And this is the price of Bitcoin over the last five years. And, and not to say these are passing fancies, the government of El Salvador is now talking about taking Bitcoin. And then we have a new holiday, you know, protest a year ago and there's a new holiday that just got enacted. So it's, uh, there's a lot happening, again, maybe with the boiling frog, not noticing these changes, but everywhere you look, there's changes. What about on the corporate side? On the corporate side, which was jaw dropping, the business roundtable, which is an, uh, a coalition of the top 200 CEOs in the, in the country and more, changed what they said the purpose of a corporation is. So for years and years and years, Milton Friedman said, the purpose of a corporation is to make money for its shareholders. And that's the sole purpose. The only thing the board should hold the CEO responsible for is making a return for their shareholders. And just two years ago, the business roundtable at the beginning of 2020 said, no, no, we think we need to maximize the benefit for all stakeholders. So not just the people who own the company, the shareholders, but the employees, the communities that they're in, even the planet in terms of making sure that you know, they're responsible stewards and not polluting too much. 
employee advocacy has really come on the rise with, with protests at Google and Apple about their policies. And in his annual letter, Larry Fink, Fink the CEO of the biggest private equity firm in the world with trillions under management, said they will be increasingly disposed to vote against management and board directors when companies are not making sufficient progress on ESG. Isn't that interesting? That all of a sudden, just in the last couple of years, we're going from, we've got to make as much money and be as capitalistic as possible to we need to consider other things besides that. And these really aren't empty words. And this is happening in real time. So Exxon lost two board seats. And a hedge fund took, bought a very small position in the company and went to the board meeting and ousted two board members who are not as environmentally sensitive as that hedge fund wants them to be. I, I, and, and it was stunning. And maybe that just passed over your consciousness in the, in, the, um, in the daily flow of life, like that boiled frog, another degree or two. But you know, these things are happening in real time. And it's really... You know, quite an amazing time we're in. The SEC just yesterday, Securities and Exchange Commission, it, it's one thing for the owner of a hedge fund to say, I want the companies that I invest in to be more green. The SEC is now announcing that they want to push for more ESG climate related disclosure. They're going to require all public companies to disclose their carbon footprint and what they're doing about the environment. This is stunning in a capitalist world. Now, of course it says, we're likely to set off a burst of lobbying in Washington in reaction to this. So this is all late breaking, you know, up to the minute news, but the fact that the SEC has said, we're gonna require more disclosure, more ESG reporting, more uh, sensitivity to these issues is really, you know, quite amazing for me froggy Phil sitting, sitting, sitting in this pot of water. Um, and, then, and then things that we're just noticing over time. So the day after the most recent inauguration, Mary Barra, head of GM, the CEO of GM announced they're gonna phase out gas and diesel cars by 2035. Now, just maybe three months before that, she was in opposition to California's raising their clean air mileage standards, a complete 360. And now we're not even gonna run on gas and diesel in 15 years from now or, or 14. Volvo phase out gas engines by 2030. The biggest shipper in the world is trying to put a carbon tax on shipping fuel to get more green friendly fuels into the mix. Shipping International maritime shipping, those huge, those huge ships, like the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal a month or so ago, they count for 2% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, the equivalent of Germany. And so the CEO of that business is saying, we need to raise the price of fuel so that green fuels get more competitive. Offshore wind projects that were stalled under the previous administration just recently got approved and put through and there's gonna be much more offshore wind. There's a little bit of offshore wind by Block Island right now, but this is gonna really open up the whole Eastern seaboard to much more offshore wind. And who would have thought that in 2020, according to the EIA, the federal government, 75% of all new generation capacity that came on is green, wind or solar. 22% natural gas, 2% other. That might be hydro. I don't think any new coal plants were built in 2022. So again, while we're in this mode of things are just kind of clicking along, th this seems seismic to me. This seems like a massive change in the way the world is going to operate. Price Waterhouse Coopers is going to boost their head count by 100,000 people to target the booming market in ESG advice and compliance. So if Larry Fink is putting pressure on his portfolio companies, board members at Exxon are put changing out the governance, the shareholders are changing out the board members. If the SEC is requiring more reporting and more diligence and vigilance about this, 
this is a huge opportunity and the consulting firms are rushing behind it to make it happen. It, it's fascinating. And all this is all real time. Uh, and the date of this was probably a week or two ago. <clears throat> to me, it feels like that movie Dunkirk where, where Churchill famously said, we'll never surrender. And, uh, and, and if you know the story of Dunkirk, but the, uh, there were troops trapped in Normandy. And so basically Churchill summoned every ship he had, fishing boats, private vessels, government ships to go over and rescue those troops. And it feels a little bit, I heard this quote yesterday and, and, and it, it just went by me so fast I couldn't track it down, but it was in reaction to something that was happening. And, and the woman who was the head of this initiative said, you know, it, it's great, we're doing this, we've got to launch all the ships. Like every single sector of the economy, every single company, every single actor needs to be as green as possible because according to the science, we're, we're running out of time rapidly. Um, probably the best class I took in business school was called uh, change management, managing plan change. And I took the course from uh, Fred Lewin's um, collaborator. And uh, it was really, really amazing how you actually create change. And, and the course had one, one objective. Edgar Schein sat there on his desk the first day, had a stack of books this high, you know, next to him, books he had written about change management and corporate culture. And he basically said, there are no tests in this class. There are no papers. The only thing I want you to do is over the course of this semester is go try and change something. And then let's talk about it every week and how it's going. I'm sort of digressing a little bit, but Bruce and I were partners on that case and, and we decided we wanted to make teaching a more important part of the tenure decision on how they decide who gets tenure at MIT. And you know, when we said that, Shine puts his head down, looks at us and said, okay, good, you know, good luck with that. And we trundle down to the main offices and we make our case and we were summarily rebuffed. Like if you look up rebuff in the dictionary, you'd see Bruce and I sitting dejectedly on the stairs of uh, Chapin Hall. And uh, we pivoted that to actually creating a faculty appreciation day. We had a party for the faculty and had a teacher of the year award. So if we couldn't push the change because the system was so locked into what it was doing, we decided to pull the change. And so we had a faculty pre appreciation day that went on for 20 years after we left. And I say all that because one of the things that I ran into in that class was this model. And it's pretty simple, right? Like a system that is where it is, is frozen. It is doing business the way it's been doing forever. You need to unfreeze that system. And while it's in a liquid malleable state, make a change and then refreeze it to make it last. And we hear that kind of language in many, many quarters today. And it probably related to the environment it sort of build back better. We're a moment of unfreezing and we're realizing that, oh, we, can we keep going this way with the planet warming? Can we keep doing that? We've got to make some changes. The wind farm we talked about, more governance around ESG um, and those sorts of things. And then let's freeze it in a new place so that we can move forward. And I think that's what's happening now as we're, as we're sitting in our, our, our pots of water, we're noticing that you know, things are starting to change. And, and the pandemic really accelerated that. That was like, not just a gradual unfreezing, that was a like one-time thing that like is gonna be a real step function in, in, a, in, a, in a watershed in our lives. Around the pandemic, one of the things that is really related in many ways to ESG is the return to work. I don't know how many people on the call are actually going back to their office or not, or they're still working from home. I'm still working from home. Um, but there's now a lot of thought about, okay, come September, we're gonna open the office. My daughter's gonna have to go to DC and, and go to the company she joined after college. It's finally opening their office. She's been with us for the last year. And so she's asking me, like, you know, dad, how's that going to work? We're going to have to wear masks in the office. Will people be vaccinated? What if I'm not comfortable? And, you know, I, and, and I don't think there's a playbook for this. It's not as if people go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, we've had a return to work before. Let's dust off the playbook and we're going to go ahead and do that. But there's plenty of risk, plenty of concerns. 
um, and plenty of people trying to come in and help figure it out. And in many ways, it's very much related to the ESG. Uh, whoops. Right, so it, in, in this quote really struck me. The real office, the, the real issue about when to reopen your office or not is really addressing the persistent health, safety, and confidence issues of your workforce your people need to be comfortable in order for them to come back to work. And looking at this, I see two words that are particularly interesting to me, persistent, right? One may think, oh yeah, COVID's gone, everybody's vaccinated, this is just a one-time thing. You know, it's just, you know, we'll be good when all this ends, but this will persist. I'm not saying this, this particular pandemic will, but concerns about health and lead buildings and air quality, et cetera, are really important. And, and employees having confidence and attachment and, 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 and supporting management and believing that management has their best intentions at heart. Another thing that's happening out there is something called the great resignation. How many people have heard of that as a phenomenon? It's been estimated that up to 40% of people are gonna change jobs in the next year. I'm sure a hangover the pandemic. I'm sure possibly because their employer has a, a return to work policy they're not happy about that they require them to return back to work or they uh, have a policy that they're not supportive of. But there's gonna be a big transition here too and it's up to companies and employers to figure out how to re-engage, re-enlist, reattach your people to your company because flight risk is, is a very, very important thing that's coming about post pandemic. So if you look at these two big trends I've just talked about, you've got the ESG trend where there's much more concerned about the environment writ large, but also the environment within the company, policies, um, hiring, promotion, um, equity, gender equity, et cetera and then return to work. There's many, many common things that you can sort of handle each of those with the same set of interventions. And, and that, that, that intersection falls in the idea of wellness, employee wellness, productivity, employee engagement. You know, how do you get people to really uh, be committed again, re-enlist with the company? And we believe there's a big role for technology to play in that. Um, there was a whole set of infrastructure that was put in place after 9-11. I mean, I used to work in downtown Boston, which was literally a subway a, a ride away to the airport. And in the early 90s, I had a consulting job that required a lot of travel. I could literally be in my office at five o'clock, go down the elevator, hop in a taxi, get to the airport at 5.15, walk down the concourse and get on a 5.30 flight. It was that easy. You show your ticket, you get on. Now that's a whole new process. If you don't show up at least an hour early to your flight, the odds of you getting on it are pretty low. But because of that exogenous one-time factor, a whole set of infrastructure was put in place. And, and, and we at MicroShare, and I believe there'll be an analogous infrastructure that gets put in place in response to all the conditions we're seeing today. And I'm gonna take you down a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, so we believe that sensors and the internet of things and big data and analytics are really gonna be driving the future in a lot of these areas. So I'm not sure if people know this story, but the internet of things was born on Carnegie Mellon. Um, they attribute it to MIT sometimes, it was really Carnegie Mellon and they have plenty of uh, smart cookies there as well in the mid eighties. And, uh, and, and it was put in place because the computer science students just get tired of going up from where they were in the computer lab up three flights of stairs to get the Coke machine because they needed a little caffeine jolt and to find out that the machine was empty. So they put a sensor in the Coke machine so that they'd know when it was empty and then wouldn't go up and bother take the, the walk up there because while well, it's empty, I'm not gonna bother. If it was full, then they'd go up and, and make the effort to go up there. So that was the very first uh, sensor linked to a computer. And, you know, it was quite the thing. And, 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 and there are many, many stories and words written about how this is the future. 
but it got off to a very slow start because sensors were very expensive. And so they only deployed sensors in really high value industrial applications. So it was called the industrial IoT or the industrial internet of things. And famously in, you know, in GE jet engines, you get thousands of data points per second about the functioning of the engine. That's pretty important to know if you're at 35,000 feet going at 600 miles an hour. So it made sense to put in these high value applications. But now there's a lot of things driving uh, the opportunity for widespread adoption. First of all, the capabilities of the sensors, like any computer chip, have gotten so much better, so much more sophisticated. And like computer chips, based on Moore's law, the costs have just come rocketing down. So for an implementation of sensors, it's way more cheaper, order of magnitude cheaper than in the days of uh, GE implementing it in their jet engines. The next thing is huge is the, I, the advent of five-year battery life. So these tiny sensors that are really powerful can be powered on batteries that last five years. So you don't really have to wire them in again. So the installation of sensors has gotten so much easier and, and so much easier. You just literally take the adhesive strip off the back, stick it to the wall, stick it to a, a piece of furniture, and you're off and running. And then you know it'll fail five years later and you change the battery as opposed to wiring it in all that infrastructure required. And then cloud computing. It's ubiquitous and really cheap. So now you have a place to put all that data that comes off those sensors and do analytics on it, generate insights that drive behavior and, 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 and profitability. I was reading uh, the New York Times maybe six months ago, and they had an article about the internet of animals. And I thought that was hilarious. So what they do in much the same what I just explained, they have solar powered sensors that they attach to animals and they can check their migration patterns. So they don't, they don't even use a battery, they, the solar um, powers them. And then they shoot the data up to a satellite network. They don't do it to the cloud. They'd use satellites instead of um, gateways because you know, there's no gateways in the jungle. So they use the satellite data transmission solution. But anyway, the interesting quote about the article besides like water buffalo having sensors being kind of a cool thing. And they've always tagged birds, you know, with those little bands around their, their legs, et cetera. The, the quote from this biologist from Yale said, it's a new era. We will discover things about species behavior that we didn't even think about. So because you have all this data, like you couldn't even imagine even thinking, but the fact that they now have all this real time data has caused them to bring all kinds of new questions to the fore. And that's really the same kind of thing we see with our clients. When we show them data, they think of stuff that we would never even think about. And so it's really interesting to see how this, this emerges and evolves when, when people have experience with seeing data they hadn't seen before. So the way, I, the way we think about it is that after that, you know, 9-11, there was that permanent infrastructure with TSA and the scanners and the, and, the, and the wands and the bag checking. We believe that the return to work in this post-pandemic new normal will have a similar technology adoption and will benefit similarly from technology. So, so we can see an office space with sensors in it, air quality monitors, occupancy and anonymous people counting. So where are the people in your building? touch-free feedback. If you see something, you can hit a button and, 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 and give feedback to it or a request service. A predictive cleaning. Why, why do you clean every bathroom on the same route when the one on the first floor has 10 times the amount of traffic as the one on the third floor? And then universal contact tracing, something that we, we developed uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and clients like GlaxoSmithKline and, and Gilead, et cetera, uh, um, have all deployed. So there's real room for technology alongside people to really create um, great outcomes. And when you look at this, there's benefits in a whole variety of ways here, right? So from on one axis, reducing costs or driving productivity and revenue, right? With this data and this information. And then there's employee engagement and wellness. And then risk reduction. 
So when you look at the data that can come from these sensors, you get benefits in all kinds of ways, but they certainly will make employees more productive. They'll get employees more engaged, affiliated to you and loyal. And then you can save up to 40% of facilities operating costs when you have data that can help you guide it, drive behavior with insight driven analysis. On the employee engagement thing, it was really interesting. We put these touch-free feedback sensors all around a client's office. And it's literally a QR code. So you take your phone, you scan it, and then you put the answer in. And the CEO came by and said, uh, I love this. It, it gives the illusion that we actually are engaged with our people. And people are responding so positively that we're actually asking them things. Now, we will actually do what we hear about by and large, but just the fact that we have these things up there, people are more committed to us, more loyal. And in an era where people are talking about the great resignation, keeping good people really, really matters to your, your top and bottom line. So the, the, the three solutions that make a lot of sense to us are occupancy monitor. Who's where in a return to work situation? Who's in the building? Where are they? Do we need so much space? Why do we have so, we need more conference rooms? We don't have enough, uh, et cetera. What's the traffic flow look like? And then environmental and air quality monitoring. We recently installed a, a, an, a, an environmental sensor in a rare book library and they noticed how out of whack the humidity was in that building. And humidity and rare books do not go together. And when they noticed that, they talked to, to their HVAC vendor and they fixed the way the airflow came in. And without the sensor, they would have never known that. And the third piece to this is touch-free feedback, which is really, really interesting. And, and again, this is one of those things like the internet of animals where you go, wow, we can start asking employee questions and getting them engaged and, and getting their feedback. And if they see something wrong, they can alert us more than just you know go back to their desk grumbling. So really kind of quite, quite, quite an interesting suite of solutions. And so if you think about it, these are must have capabilities for two reasons, the facilities and the wellness team, the HR folks, the managers really need to understand in this return to work environment about their space. And what about resources? If you provide food to your employees and you're in a partial hybrid situation, how do you know how much food to buy on a daily basis to, to feed the people? Uh, the health of the environment and feedback to your employees. And the employees, when we see from those Google protests and either the great resignation or reticence to go back to work, they want to have agency. They want to have some control. They're just not going to go back to work. They want to know that the air quality is okay. Because guess what? Air quality, carbon dioxide, et cetera, is a proxy for how fast the earth, the air is circulating. And guess what? COVID's airborne. So if you've got good air quality from a CO2 perspective, you're likely to have enough airflow where you're okay from a COVID perspective. So it gives the employees agency to figure out where they're gonna work, if they're conference-free, um, work on based on environmental quality, and they can feel like they're engaged. And you know, if there's, we have predictive cleaning in bathrooms, and you'll see a video about this, but there's a button, a five button sensor, we're out of soap, we need paper. And if employees can have input, they can feel like they're managing their situation and they're, they're, they're getting their needs met. And of course, it doesn't all go in an office, you can have these sensors in warehouses for many of the same things. Asset zoning is an important one for a warehouse, where are all your forklifts? Uh, in an airport, where are all the luggage carts? So uh, in hospitals, where are all the um, wheelchairs? You have to have a wheelchair to discharge a patient. Anybody know where all the wheelchairs are? You want to take a guess? They're all in the maternity ward, apparently, <laughs> to help the new moms get their babies out. But if you have to ditch, discharge somebody and there's no wheelchairs, you've got to um, you know, wait for a free wheelchair. So anyway, there's there's lots of use cases and lots of ways uh, you can sensor up a building. And you add energy to it, we've got these little clamps that just go on the, on the wires in, your, in, in the panel box. You can tell where the energy is going, which machines, which air conditioning units, chillers, fans, motors, 
where the energy is going. You can also see different usage patterns. And if something goes out of phase or out of pattern, you go, oh, that machine might need servicing before it breaks down. The last thing you wanna do is have a machine break down and it stops your whole line. Whereas if you can know, get known in advance, it's out of tolerance. And then from a sort of from an energy savings point of view, you can see what, what are your most energy consuming pieces of equipment in your building. And then you can also understand peak demand. And those people that know how to buy energy know you wanna lower your, lower your peak demand because that's a big multiplier on your electricity bill. So if you put you know, the office sensing and the energy sensing together, you can get, create a really nice ESG dashboard that talks about environment, social and governance aspects to, to how you're running your company. And these, this, is gonna, can, this is gonna start to be what the Price Waterhouse consultants, those 100,000 people they're gonna hire are gonna use with their clients so that they can feed the data for each client and do their ESG reporting. Well, it's one thing to do that report once a year when you need to for the SEC, it's even better if you can monitor on an ongoing basis so you can get your employees engaged and excited about staying to work for you. So the idea of a sensor-based solution is continuous. It's audible because the data is always right there. It's actionable because you turn the data into insights. I kind of like to say it's like making maple syrup. The data is like the, the sap you tap from the trees and then the dashboards and the analytics is how you boil and boil and boil that sap down to a really sweet insight that then you can go make a change in how you operate your business and either drive more productivity or save money or decrease risk or get your employees more engaged. And this can also be provocative. Like you see this data for the first time and clients are like, whoa, I didn't even know that. It was interesting at one of our clients in the real height of the pandemic when there was real concerns we were doing contact tracing, they noticed one group of people walked around to every part of the building. And it was the mailroom people. And so, and one mailroom person got infected and they, you know, they sent that person home. But imagine if that person had walked to every desk before they had to go home that day. So they split up the mailroom routes and, and de-risked by only having people go to certain parts of the building. And so it was interesting, that was, that was no use case that we came up with thinking in advance, but when you see the data, like creative minds just get to work and they come up with really interesting things. Um, I'm getting towards the end here. Um, so really, you know, when you get down to this new technology and able to do a whole lot of things, cost efficiency and, 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 and compliance with rules and regulations, employee wellness, productivity and safety, engagement, affinity, and then resilience and sustainability. And, uh, and our CEO likes to say, you know, we save money, we save lives, and we save the planet. And with this kind of data and information, you can really do that. And, and, in, in, and in days when you really need your employees engaged, you need to give them the agency so they have control, so they can build up trust and confidence and, and want to stay with you and grow with you. Um, in the spirit of a picture is worth a thousand words, um, we have a video that's a two minutes. It's a little bit fun. It's a little bit stylized, so it's a little bit cheeky, but um, th th this may be just kind of fun to illustrate what, what we're talking about.
I think uh, at this point, I uh, hope you enjoyed that video. We had fun making it. It's a, it's a little uh, a little cheeky, but um, you know, when you see you want to star in a movie, you kind of let them let them go for it, right? Um, so um, thank you for your time. And, and Joe, I guess you're going to organize questions. So um, I'll I guess it's time to open up the floor. I suppose. Yeah. Oh, sure. Scott will from our team. Yep. Hey, Phil, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. I thought that was really interesting. Um, you provided a lot of nice context. Yeah, it was great. Um, I'll start with a question that's not my own because I put a question in, but I'll let the others go first. So Tom Kelly from Purchase College asked about how your sensor technology integrates with existing systems. I guess he's asking about a business's BMS, which I think means building management system. And he's also asking, do the sensors perform vibration testing to measure motor performance? And honestly, I don't really know what that means, but if you need more information, Tom's on the call. Yeah, Tom, that's a great question. And um, we see sensors plus BMS is really a killer app because those, those BMS systems, as you know, are you know decades old, right? They've just been around forever. They, they come when you install your new HVA system system and I imagine in a university setting uh, you know you don't have the capital expenditure to keep that up to date and I know I worked at UMass Dartmouth for about a year and a half in their Center for Innovation um, and you know the capital um, the capex required in the deferred maintenance was really high in the university setting so um, so so it's hard to move those BMS systems forward and putting a sensor on top drawing data out of the BMS, combining with sensor data is really a killer app. And we have, uh, we've, we've certainly done that with some integration partners. So we provide the base technology and then an integration partner would come in and combine the sensing data that we have with the, um, the data from the BMS and able to really generate a lot of great insights. And then to the second question, yes, vibration sensing, absolutely because that's one of the key triggers to a machine going out of whack is if it starts vibrating too much or using too much energy, you know, there's a bearing that's, uh, you know, stuck or something. But yeah, yes, that's very possible as well. So the oh, Tom. Hey, Tom, thanks for sharing your video. Nice to see you. <laughs> so, Tom, did you have any follow up or was that, a, was that a, enough of an answer for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I could probably ask about 30 or 40 questions, but I don't want to monopolize the end meeting. So by all means, others, please. Okay, so the next question, I, I thought the video was interesting about, you know, how you made it so relevant to the time we're living in now, you know, seeing the guy with the mask on and, you know, clearly you're dealing with like, you know, sensor technologies that are especially relevant during COVID pertaining to cleaning and, you know, things that you know, not being too crowded in a in a cafe, which was not a concern pre-COVID, obviously, because maybe you wanted to see your friends. So Verenda is asking, you know, what about these technologies in five to 10 years or whenever, sort of the, the post-COVID world, when we're comfortable being close to each other, um, will they adapt or, you know, what, do you, what, what are they gonna look like? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, I think we're naive to think that we're out of the woods and, oh, just this pandemic and now, it's going to end and there's never going to be another pandemic. Um, I've read some fairly scary podcasts that say we got off light with this pandemic because there's pandemic, there's viruses that have spread faster and have been more deadly. And if we had either of those two, and you, and you think like, oh, I couldn't get toilet paper. Well, what happens when the whole food supply chain breaks down? Right? So, so, um, 
So it, it, it would be nice if it all just went back to the way it was and we could hug our friends again. And, and we had dinner with our friends and we hugged them for the first time, the, parent, the godparents and my kids, you know, it's like, oh my God, we can do this again, right? Um, but um, I think it's a little naive to think that, that we're, we're out of the woods. And, and even if not, there's a competitive advantage in hiring and retaining employees if the entity, whether it's a university or a hospital or a company, shows care and concern for their employees, they're progressive. They're, they're at the top track of all ESG metrics. They're, they're, they, they promote diversity, they promote inclusion, they, they make sure my environment, I'm in a lead building, they monitor the air quality all the time. I wanna work for a company like that and not the one that says, all right, a, I didn't put sensors in to begin with, or B, rip them out now that the, the, the crisis has passed, right? I mean, I think those companies aren't going to get the employee attention. And we're starting to hear, right, with the SEC and BlackRock, they're not going to get investor attention either. And that's, you know, that's the lifeblood of the company is, is you know, cash, you know, cash for investment. So, so while I'd love it to be just the way it was, you know, in 1985, when I could just go to the airport and walk through and it'd be no problem. I still got to take my shoes off. Well, nobody's brought a shoe bum on the plane in 15 years, right? You know, so uh, I don't know. I'm with you, Varunda. I want it to happen, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, um, yeah. so actually, I wanted to align my question with Scott's. So his was like for small companies. What about the greenhouse gas emission data? So that's what like my main, main concern was. Let's say uh, this technology is very fruitful for larger corporations and company size with larger employees. But what about the small ones? Well, that's where the prices have come so down so fast on sensing, right? So if you have a big building, 20 stories, you've got to put sensors on all the floors. If you have a small company, one floor, you know, you need fewer sensors. So the price per square foot is the same, whether you're big or small. So it's not like you're disadvantaged because you're small. It's not like there's a huge fixed cost that big companies can absorb. And then, you know, that marginal cost is low. It's very low to begin with. You, you buy the, the data storage by the drink, you, you buy the sensors, they're, they're, they're cheap. And our model, not to do much of a sales pitch, I, I want to avoid that, is we just lease it. So you just pay a monthly fee and don't even have to buy the equipment. You just install it, a monthly fee for the data service and, and we take care of everything. Our CEO sort of saw this industry as one of the problems with IoT adoption is that you want to drive a car. You don't want to assemble brake pads and an engine and a body and a chassis and tires and a gas tank. But that's the way IoT was, had been sold for a really long time. So there's so many components from the sensor to the gateways to the backhaul, to the telemetry, to the data storage, to the analytics. And there's companies at each one of those pieces on the value chain, but nobody put it together. And, and our CEO had that vision to put it all together in one package, just pay by the month and you know, you're done. You don't have to worry about buying the sensors. What if they break? What if the battery runs out? Uh, what if I don't have enough data storage in the cloud? None of that. He, he likes to joke that um, our clients don't even know how to spell IoT because <laughs> we make it so simple for them so um and, and phil it could be like a very interesting application in the last 10 years or so we've seen a trend in, in office to co-working spaces right. um to really inform how how the occupancy is uh i see utility there and higher education where you, where you really want to know where 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 your students are congregating so you can reach them with community it can help inform communications it can help with workloading with janitorial and engineering scheduling downtime for major replacements rather than relying on surveys you have all the information at your fingertips so i think it has it has a lot of implications you know and in a post or during pandemic world. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. I think it allows companies to be very proactive and not necessarily wait for things to be reported. And what's interesting is that in our program, the Green Business Partnership, a lot of our action items actually center around, well, some of them center around 
for example, employees detecting a, a leaky faucet or having a reporting program for, you know, if they see an issue with their AC, you know, or any other system within the building, obviously this is, you know, the future is really where this is automated and you don't rely on employees going out, going around their bathrooms looking for leaky faucets, right? So I think it's kind of cool if it's more, you know, reliable and proactive versus waiting for things to be reported by people who might not even be in the office anymore because for whatever reason, so. Oh, there's a huge, um, I read an article about Legionella disease, right? Because water's stagnating. So they have people going around hotels that are empty, flushing toilets, opening showers, opening sinks. And they do that just to make sure the water flows and, and those uh, right. bacteria don't build up. So it's, re it's really like, the, the, like that discontinuity from how the disruptive the pandemic was, I think is that moment that the system is unfrozen now. And what do we do now to respond to freeze it in a much better place? And I think this kind of new infrastructure just makes it, it makes a lot of sense for us because we're selling it, right? So I'll, I'll say that out loud, but um, you know, it just makes so much sense. It's, uh, it's cheap, it's disruptive, and it's, you know, it, it's the wave of the future. So my original question, and if anyone else has anything, please unmute yourself. My original question that I typed in was, um, what are some tips for dealing with like data overload? Because Feel like with all of this new these new sensor technologies you have so much information coming in like are there are do you have any tips for companies to like deal with that information or make it easier for them to process well it's interesting so at first you're out there tapping all the maple trees and you have all this sap and you don't know what to do with it you're overwhelmed right and you just got to boil it and boil it and boil it down and so we've moved from just data graphs to dashboards to um, alerts, to scoring, and then alerts. So right now, and Joe, you can probably attest this, it's hard to get minimum wage people to go on cleaning jobs. It's hard to find them, right? There's extra unemployment stimulus, might be more economic for them to stay home and then not come into work. So we've developed some, some graphics that show the, the traffic in a bathroom versus the expected traffic and then ranks which one to clean. You don't wanna see the data about what the occupancy in the bathroom was. You wanna see the data about any of that. You just wanna know like, what's the essence? What's the point? What do I do about it? I'm, I'm glad you got all that data. I'm glad you've done your dashboard. You've done your insights and all that, but can you just send an alert to the person to go clean bathroom A when they're supposed to and just leave all that other stuff out? Just give me the thing I need to know. And it's, it's great for, that alerting system and also benchmarking. So against all the other uh, restrooms you need to clean or all the other conference rooms you need to clean, you know where you stand. So it's really, it, it just gives a new, so it's really all about the insight, right? It's not about how many trees you tap, it's about that little symbol of sweet maple syrup you put on your pancake that really delivers the punch. It's doing things smarter, you know. Yeah. So does anyone else have any questions um, before we wrap up? It looks like we have four minutes to go until the official end. Well, Phil, I wanna thank you. This was fascinating. Um, just really a wonderful presentation. And I am going to share with everybody who is here today and, and even those who are not here. Um, and it's really just, just so interesting to uh, look at the future. And you know, as we said, tech is here, the knowledge is here, and it really does make a huge difference. And this is what we need. So thank you so much. Um, you, I will share your contact information in the email tomorrow, but please put it in the chat right now. So if anybody wants to grab it, they can grab it um, while we're still here. I know that Tom Kelly probably has a lot more questions <laughs> than he wants to ask you. And Joe, thanks so much for bringing the program to us. Um, really, really appreciate your sharing this um, idea and concept with, with the Green Business Partnership and our community. My okay, pleasure, so everybody, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so everybody has Phil's contact. I'm gonna give you a, a moment to jot that down and i just put it in the chat too 
Perfect. For those of us that are. Um... You want to copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. All right, terrific. All right, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it and uh, take care everybody. Good luck. You too. You have a great day. Yep, bye now.